Less than 1% become financially independent. Most people aren't. Most people are basically indebted and they have a decrescendo as they get older in life. So how is your relationship with money? This is an interesting question to ask. Many people struggle in this area. I just saw something on, I believe, an Instagram post, or maybe it was on some sort of a thing I'd read that shows that about six and a half thousand dollars on credit card debt is the average in America that people keep rolling in their credit card and keep getting in debt further. And I, I look at that and it's, they say that about 10% of your gross income per year is typically the amount you keep on debt on credit cards. Credit cards are designed for banks to make money, not you. Credit cards are for you to have immediate gratification to spend money on things that 30 days later or so you pay. And by the way, anytime you separate pleasure from pain, you activate the amygdala uh, the amygdala is a subcortical area of the brain, which is more of an addictive area. And so if the bank makes you pay later uh, and buy things now, they're increasing the probability of you making an addictive behavior out of consumerism, which helps maybe the economy for people who are smarter with money. Uh, they buy the stocks in these companies, but not for the person that keeps spending money. Uh, you know, it used to be when I grew up that you put things away on layaway, you paid for it in advance. And once it is, you deferred the gratification, you finally got what you wanted after it's all paid off. But we've reversed it. Now we get what we want. And then we pay afterwards. And we get the pleasure immediate gratification, then we get the pain later, and we separate them. And so we don't really get the idea that the pain is happening at the time we're buying. We don't get that feeling. In fact, if we had to pay for cash, we would think twice about impulse buying, we would go in there with more foresight, and think about what we're buying instead of just impulse buy. So how's your, how's your relationship with money? That's a good question. Is it something that you have an intention of having you work for it or you having it work for you? So you might want to take a note here too, but money can be seen two different ways. You can actually be a master of money and manage it wisely and have it work for you. Or you can be a mass, mass conscious individual like most people with the statistics that are in debt and uh, become a slave to money and have you work for it. You decide. People that work for other people usually pay the most taxes and get the most debt. People that work for their own companies usually have a little less taxes and have a little less debt. And people that invest and buy long term and invest their money into something that's an asset pay the least amount of taxes and have the least amount of debt. And they become masters of the money instead of having to be a slave to the money. So how's your relationship with it? Well, that boils down to your relationship with your values. So you heard me talk about values almost every time I do a presentation because it underlies all human behavior. So the question is, is where is wealth building? Where is money management wisely managing money on your hierarchy of values? Each of your individual, each individual has a set of priorities, a set of values that are unique to them. Whatever's high on your value, you have discipline, reliability, and focus on. Whatever's low on your value, procrastinate, hesitate, frustrate on. Whatever's high on your values raises your self-worth when you act on it. And whatever's lower lowers your self-worth when you do. When you're more inspired by something spontaneously, you become more efficient. And when you're doing something low in priorities, you become less efficient. And one is self-worth and self-appreciative, and the other one is self-depreciative. And the way you manage money is a reflection of that. If you devalue yourself, you'll typically pay yourself last. If you value yourself, you'll typically pay yourself first. People that value themselves and value money simultaneously are people that want to buy things that go up in value, assets that go up in value and appreciate with value. They, they buy things that gain interest in compounding and capital gains and grows in value. So they become less and less having to work and more and more having it work for them. People that devalue money and devalue themselves usually spend it on media gratification to compensate for their own fulfillment. And they go buy things and they fill their home with stuff. When you stop and think about it, probably a quarter of your home is storage. So you pay a, a half a million dollars for a home or something, or maybe three or four hundred thousand, depending on what country you're in. Some countries it's a million average household, a million dollars to get a house. And some place like in America it'd be two to three, four hundred thousand maybe half a million in New York, in uh, New York and uh, LA. But 
a quarter of what you buy in a house goes to storage. It goes to store a house, a, a car. It goes to store clothes and stuff that sits in a pantry that you that just fills up and sits there and depreciates in value. And so you're paying, if you pay half a million dollars, $125,000 is paying for stuff being stored that's going down in value. And you stop and think about that. That's not the brightest use of money. Uh, you might want to meet a gratification that way, but you're not going to get ahead financially that way. You're going to get probably in debt. So I basically ask you, where is wealth building on your hierarchy of values? If it's, and I've done thousands of people in value determinations, and I have to say that very small percentage actually have it in the top four values of their life. In my observation, people that do not have a value on wealth building won't. They'll end up in debt most of their life. Statistically, that's the case. I remember in 2000, I did a little research project on what the average person in America was doing, and it's not that much different in some countries, at least developing countries. I found out that a great percentage of those people um, do not have financial independence for sure, and when they retire, they relied on Social Security and their kids to help them. And that's a burden to the kids, and that's you basically not thinking long term and basically wanting a major gratification, not deferring gratification for wealth building. So the question is, is where is wealth building on your hierarchy of values? If it's not the top four, my observation, you're probably not going to be financially independent. And if you don't have enough benefits, because every decision you make in life is based on what will give you the most benefits over drawbacks or advantages over disadvantage. If you don't have enough benefits and advantages of deferring gratification and putting your money aside and letting it compound and grow through interest earnings and uh, capital gains uh, and be, be prepared for having it work for you over a period of time and defer it, uh, you're not likely to have financial minutes. In fact, how are you going to? There's two ways that people get financially independent today. One is they build businesses and they let the, the income from that pass and bring in the lifestyle that they want um, and the asset accumulation. Um, and they eventually sell the business and they have a, a net worth. Or they go out and they save and invest it and buy quality companies or acquire real estate or other forms of assets that eventually accumulate and compound and eventually give passive income. But if you don't have the value of doing that and deferring gratification for long-term asset accumulation, you're probably going to be a statistic. Less than 1% become financially independent. Most people aren't. Most people are basically indebted and they have a decrescendo as they get older in life. So the question you want to ask yourself is what is your relationship with money? Where is it on your value list? Are you really buying things that go up in value? Uh, if you're buying things that do go up in value and you are patient and let it go and grow in value and compound interest, the H1 of the world, as Einstein calls it, then you're likely to get ahead financially. But if you're wanting immediate gratification and you can't govern yourself and you spend it, you have debt and you're paying ridiculous sums of money on debt, well, you've created debt. <laughs> you're not going to get financially well off if you don't live somehow within your means. If you're basically exceeding your means and keeping yourself further in debt, you're going to end up burdening your life. And time is ticking by, and all of a sudden, and I remember somebody told me when I was very young in my 20s, um, if you're 20 years old and you, you have an income, let's say a fixed income, and you save 10% of it, by the time you're 65, you can have a financial independence based on that simple lifestyle and factoring in inflation. If you're 30 years old, 20%, 40 30%, 50 years old, you need to be saving 40%, 60 50%, 70 60%. The longer you wait, the higher you have to save and invest to be able to get ahead. And when I mean save it, I don't necessarily mean uh, not investing. I mean putting it away into buying something that goes up in value. So if you're waiting and you're delaying and you're not getting into action, well, you're just working harder against yourself. I was lucky. I was 27 years old when I kind of had a wake-up call. And I started my saving stashed investing process. And once I had enough cushion to to deal with emergencies, I just kept buying assets. And I've done that now 42 years, and I've been blessed, <laughs> very blessed financially because I deferred to gratification. I allow it to work for me. And now it works more than I'm working, making me money. So I'm, I'm grateful that I learned that. It's not rocket science. It doesn't take genius. It's basically having the temperament and the patience to defer gratification and live simple until you do it. or to, if you want to raise your lifestyle, raise your income. 
You know, there's no limit on the income you can make in life. All you have to do is care enough about another human being or a multitude of individuals and find out some way of serving them and meeting their needs with some product, service, or idea. And if you're willing to do that more effectively and efficiently than somebody else, you're the one that corners the market and gets the most income. And if, they, if you don't raise your lifestyle ridiculously and live within your means and make up the difference by saving and investing, it starts to accumulate. And uh, I'm just grateful I did that. When I first started saving, I was saving, believe it or not, uh, $10 a day, $50 a week, $200 a month. And that was a stretch. But I made it 300 and then I made it 500 and then I made it 750 and then I made it 1000 and then I kept increasing it 10% every quarter. I kept raising it until it was saving and investing a very substantial amount of money. And lo and behold, from the time I started, nine years later, I was financially independent. Now it's many, many times over that way over that. And I just uh, just kept methodically doing what worked. And it was not rocket science. I have no, I mean, I've read a lot of books on the topic and I've mentored with lots of people, but I, I have to say most of that stuff was more superfluous. What really was important is to care enough about people, to serve people, to generate an income, take a portion of that and putting it away and buying quality companies. In my case, I just bought the indexes and, and just kept buying the S&P 500 equivalent. And, um, all I can say is that it's paid off. I kept my costs down and I kept investing and I, I deferred that. So the question is, is do you have more advantage, more value on deferred gratification? If you do, you have the potential for building wealth. If you don't, well, that's fine. You're going to have a decent lifestyle, but it's going to plateau because eventually you're probably going to have difficulty working. Now you can work. I'm, I'll be 70 in a few months and I, I'm still cranking out the hours. I love it. I don't do it because I have to. I do it because I really love to do it. I love teaching. But just imagine if all of a sudden you're 70 years old or 80 years old and you're maybe not able to work. If you didn't have some savings and investments, you might be borrowing money from your kids or maybe, maybe in debt. And you may have more problems and burden the next generation. So do have foresight and think in advance about what's really priority to you. Because immediate gratification costs you economically and long-term gratification pays. So the question is, is do you have enough advantages? Have you written down the benefits of doing the action steps that have proven to work financially to actually build a business that serves people or somehow work in a business that serves people? Do you have an income to live beyond, to live beneath the means of that? So you have money that's discretionary to save and invest, to automate those savings and investments so there's no emotion that can interfere with it, to set up enough cash cushion to take care of emergencies and then invest the difference and allow it to compound and grow without interfering with it. Don't gamble, don't speculate, don't, you know, try to get rich quick. Just be patient, methodical investor in quality companies or real estate holdings that serve people. If you serve people, you have sources of income. If you do that, magic stuff starts happening. Money works for you. Compound interest starts accumulating money for you. It, it's amazing. Compound interest is the eighth one of the world, as Einstein said, and it's it's amazing what it does, particularly in four, four years, four decades into it. Like I'm now at, I'm going on my fifth decade of doing it. It really takes off by then, but you got to be patient. And if you're not patient, well, you better be working and diligently building a massive company. If you build a massive company, that's the most efficient way. But investing is, that's what most people do. You pay the most taxes when you work for others. You may pay the less taxes when you work for yourself. You pay the least taxes when you invest, as I said. So the question is, the sooner you get into investments, the less taxes you're going to be paying. Now, I'm not against paying taxes. I pay them every quarter. but And I pay them every week into a, a, an account that eventually pays to the government every quarter. I have no problem paying some taxes, but not unnecessary taxes. And you're going to pay unnecessary taxes if you keep working and living with immediate gratification. You pay the least taxes if you start putting it away and let it compound and then let it buy quality companies and hold them and let them just grow and defer the gratification, defer the, the compounding with it, defer the, the, re, the taxes on it, and boom, you start moving ahead. And it's a really rewarding feeling to have your money working for you and moving ahead than it is to be burdened and in debt all your life. And that's where most people are. So do you have a higher value on the outcome of wealth building than you do on the media gratifying consumables that fill up a house that you're paying even more taxes and more more uh, debt on? It's crazy. I mean, I'm amazed at how many people spend money on things they don't need to impress people that don't care 
and uh, to have things that aren't really meaningful, that are temporary, transient uh, highs. Um, I always say when you're doing something that's really meaningful and inspiring, that's fulfilling, you fill your life that way. If not, you'll probably go and be a consumer trying to fulfill your life through food and drink and alcohol and, and addictive behaviors and consumerism, and you'll fill up a house full of crap. I mean, I know people that at one time they had a garage they could put the garage in. Now it's filled with stuff. They can't even put the car in there. See, the banks love you getting in debt. They love the fractional reserves. And now in America, fractional reserves have been thrown out. Now there's a zero system. They have no accountability to keep cash on reserve. In the process of doing that, they can just lend out indiscriminately, which is no governance. And this is crazy, but that's what's happening. And so if you're... Uh, not investing and putting money into things that are going up in value, well, you're even more vulnerable because the bank you have may not even be stable. And then you may find out the money you think you have in there is not even real. You find out that that happened in 2008 for a lot of people. So if you're if you go by the banks thinking they're going to make sure you get a house that's going to get you in debt and a mortgage pay 30 years, 25 years, you're going to have a car repeatedly doing it to keep you in debt, a credit card is going to keep you in debt. You can live in probably a suburb that you have to drive where you have to have a car and you have to have a house and there'll be a near mall that you keep using that credit card on and they keep cleaning up and making money off your immediate gratifications. So if you have a value on wealth building, you're going to want to defer the gratification and buy assets. Ask yourself, is it because there's a basic, basic rule. If you don't put your money into assets, it ends up in liabilities. If you don't fill your day with high priority actions that inspire you, it fills up with low priority distractions that don't. And when you're unfulfilled, consumerism is a byproduct of that because you're going to go fill your thing with stuff that gives you a temporary high instead of a long-term return. And uh, as a great Greek philosopher many years ago, Anaxagoras and some of the other ones basically said, um, the people that want the immediate gratification, that pleasure is insignificant compared to the pleasure of having mastered your life and having mastered it. There's seven areas of life you can empower. You can empower your business. You can empower your finance, you can empower your intellect, you can empower relationships, you can empower your social life, your physical health and well-being, and your spiritual quest. Well, money is one of them. You might as well master money. So that's one of the reasons in the Breakthrough Experience program, which I, my signature program that I teach pretty well every week or two, um, I teach people about self-worth, and I talk about living by priority. Every time you live by highest priorities and you have a value on wealth building, your self-worth goes up, your feeling of worthiness to re uh, to hold on to money goes up. When you feel down, you go into altruism and you sacrifice and give away your money for, by purchasing things. When you value yourself, you don't want to just give it away. You want to make sure that you put it into something that's meaningful. You learn to have sustainable, fair exchange with people and serve people and make sure that you're thinking of not only yourself, but your family, your community. You're thinking what philanthropically. People that do things that are money with meaning are philanthropic. People that have money without meaning tend to be debaucherous and they tend to squander their money away. That's why you go from rags to riches to rags again, because people that had a drive to do something, go out and build their wealth and had a value on it, they became wealthy. The people that took it for granted and didn't have a drive, they end up debaucherously wiping it out like the Vanderbilts did. So that's why I say it's having a cause greater than yourself helps build wealth. So there's six things that I found common to wealthy people. One is they cared enough about humanity to build a business that served ever greater numbers of people. And two, they ended up having mastered the efficiency of that business where they mastered the management of it, where it was effective and efficient at making profits. Then the third thing is they took profits and they saved an ever progressive portion of it and kept putting it away and making sure they had stability. And then they invested, number four was investing in ever greater degrees of leverage and keep buying assets. And five is they allowed themselves to accumulate and didn't just raise their lifestyle during that whole time, but allowed the lifestyle to stay simple while they build up assets until the lifestyle could incrementally be raised. And the last one is they had some cause that was inspiring to them, that was meaningful, that they wanted to dedicate their life and their wealth building towards. Something that's meaningful to them, because otherwise you're going to just give it mostly in taxes to the government and they may squander it and rescue people and rob people of dignity, accountability, responsibility, and productivity. But if you actually do it and you can become philanthropic and decide where those money's going instead of paying unnecessary taxes and, and giving it to social things that may not be meaningful to you, you can decide what's meaningful and you can go in and, and help other people in a way that's not 
stopping them from doing self-sufficiency on their own life. So there's meaningful there. So the question is, what's your relationship with money? And that's why I teach the breakthrough experience to help people get their self-worth together, to live by priority, to maximize their productivity, to maximize their meaning in life, to allow themselves to defer gratification, to make sure they grow their wealth, to not sit and compare themselves to other people, but compare their daily actions to what's meaningful to them and their priorities in life, to allow themselves their self-worth to go up and to allow themselves to build the wealth that they want. I'm a firm believer that you deserve to have empowerment in all areas of your life. Wealth is one of them. It's not more important or less important than the other areas of life, but you might as well master all of them. That's been my, that's the whole purpose of Breakthrough is to help you master all areas of your life. Master the business growth, master your mental faculties and your genius and wake up your genius. Master your relationship, master wealth building, master your leadership skills, master your physical health and well-being. You're not living just to eat, you're eating to live, you're eating to perform and you're, you're exercising to perform and mastering an inspired life. You deserve to have an inspired life. That's why I tell people to come to the Breakthrough Experience. Like they learn some of the tools that 50 years worth of research has helped me present. And I've gotten to incorporate and empower all those areas in my life because of it. So passing it on to you is what I love doing. And particularly the economic one, because my, my experience is people that do master that. And I mean really master it, not just accumulate it and then debaucherize with it, but to actually accumulate it and do something really meaningful for humanity. Those individuals I watch having amazing tears of gratitude and fulfillment in life. So that's why I'm doing this little presentation right now, because to ask you, what's your relationship with money? Do you have a value on wealth building or do you not? Do you want it to work for you or do you want to work for it? Do you want to be a slave or a master? Where do you want to play in the game of finances? If you really have a value on it, you'll be studying it, learning about it. And, and when you do, you'll be prioritizing what you're reading, making sure it's a real asset development not just immediate gratifying gambling and casinos and quick at rich schemes that many people like to sell and to get dopamine highs and buy. I'm talking about really learning about the, the key of mastering money. Mastering money is really about mastering your life because if you have sustainable fair exchange and you're not exaggerating yourself or minimizing yourself relative to people and you have really caring relationships that are long term, you're on your way to building wealth. So it's a mastery of life. That's why in the Breakthrough Experience, I'm trying to help people get empowered in all areas because they all overlap and help each other. And why not have financial independence? Why not have an extraordinary life? Why not have a deeply meaningful something that's a cause that you dedicate your energies to? That's what I'm focused on. So I just want to take a moment to talk about transforming your relationship with money. Because if you have a priority, if you stack up the benefits and the advantages and keep stacking up of those six things I just outlined, and they have more advantages to, def to defer the gratification than disadvantages and more benefits of doing the action steps that have proven to work, then you're on your way and you'll basically be a master of money instead of its slave. So that was my message today on uh, your looking at your relationship with money and just know that it's your life. You're not right or wrong, whatever way you do it. You're not, uh, you know, unethical if you decide to make your kids depend on you. But I personally don't know of anybody who can honestly say that's what their dream is. Most people would like to get masterful in their life and master all areas of their life. So if you'd like to do that, come and join me at the Breakthrough Experience. Keep listening to some of these podcasts. If you know somebody that really can benefit from these presentations I do, please pass the torch to them. Let them know about it. Subscribe to our, our, our channel and our work here and uh, help us get the message out. Because I assure you that there's if we help other people get what that what they want to get in life, we get what we want to get in life. And that's why I do this every single week, because I know it's, I get letters in every single week, almost every single day, and people have taken this and it, and it spurred an idea in their life. That's our objective here. So please pass the torch, come to the Breakthrough Experience, and let me give whatever I've been researching for 50-something years to help you pass, pass the torch to you so you can go do something extraordinary with your life.